Hi there, Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio here, joined with my very good friend Sam Sim to talk about the all new British Drama Toolkit. Now, I'm just going to briefly tell my story about it because it's like really short compared to your involvement. But basically, I started giving away samples on my vlog and you sent me something and said, just have a go at this. And because I'm lazy and only like samples that I make somewhat arrogantly, <laughs> um, it wasn't until we'd had a few beers and you actually dragged me into your studio to have a listen. And uh, I, I just have to play kind of the, the kind of thing that Sam played, which was... So my reaction was, uh, this is something I do when we win at football. This. And I said, Sam, we've just got to do it. And this was only kind of a few weeks ago, and it's been a kind of amazing trip ever since then. So what is it and why and how, where did it come from? OK, so it's based around velocities rather than velocity crossfades. So the idea is that um, you have two hands on the keyboard and you can play it without having to worry about faders or moving around different um, key switches or anything like that. You have just three layers, a very kind of textural sound that's beautiful for harmony. And then um, the very loudest layer is being very expressive, so you can play your melodies. Or, um, and then there is a, another layer that sort of bridges the gap. So the whole idea is that uh, you've got an instrument that offers you a breadth of emotion within a single patch. Right, and that's why we've actually called it British Drama Toolkit. And it's available to buy now on the site, but stick with us because you're going to take us through how you use it. But I'm really interested to know, um, for people who don't know your work, you're, uh, uh, like I uh, was at one point, incredibly busy um, uh, uh, t TV and film composer. And it's kind of come out of that, hasn't it? This is a library that I wanted to make because um, I thought I could really use it. <laughs> And it's something that, uh, you know, when you're writing um, a lot of uh, music for uh, film, television, it's, uh, you're normally uh, in a position where you're writing, you have to write a huge amount of mm -hmm. music. So you're clawing for anything that's going to give you some inspiration or get the job done quickly. Right. And um, I find that uh, you, you also, um, uh, there's a lot of samples out there at the moment that, um, kind of push you into a certain way of working sure. and there's a process. So that, for example, you've got some really beautiful textual uh, libraries in Spitfire, mm. all the, uh, the Evo grids and the swarms and that kind of sure. thing. But what I find is that sometimes you lay down uh, one of those patches and you're looking at the picture going, this is great, this is wonderful, but now I have to start uh, adding something else. And um, at that stage, you then have to kind of stop the playing, you could go into the sequencer, you'll then start committing to a BPM, a, uh, a meter, and yeah. then you, you're sucked into the kind of the vortex of the computer. I wanted to do something where you could have those kind of textures playing, but you could move the harmony around more, you could improvise melodies, um, and not be so constrained by the process. Absolutely. And the reason why we came up with the, the idea of it being a British drama toolkit is basically British drama tends to be more emotive, or rather the actors aren't emotive, it's all going on inside their heads, but it tends to be more about kind of character studies and, and uh, uh, emotional stuff, basically because we can't afford the CGI. Um, so that's why we kind of felt that, that it's instead of it just being atmospheric and textural, as you say, that it is musical, it has, a, you can articulate emotion with it. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Completely, and you know, also for, um, for scoring purposes, when you're, uh, uh, you want the uh, music or the vehicle of the music is obviously to make uh, the audience feel more for the yeah. characters. Um, and uh, so to have the tools where you can be in one place, one patch, and actually have a, um, a very wide um, expressive capabilities through that patch. It's incredibly useful. It's very good for scoring. It's very good for um, uh, reacting to the picture as it comes, as you, um, you know, sort of 
jam along with it. Absolutely. Well, that's what I notice is you're kind of reacting to the, the players as well. Do you want to just take us through the patch that I just used and, and just to give us a kind of a sense yeah. of, of how best to use it and, and how it works? Absolutely. So you've got, um, as I say, three layers. Uh, you have a um, uh, texture. Asking the players to um, be very kind of uh, delicate but quite expressive, let the the bows sort of move and bounce a little bit, and so uh, basically give you a um, the ability to hold down a chord for a while. But you've got to do something to avoid a static nature. There's a lot of um, interest in there, yeah. and so that. That constitutes the, the bottom layer. And then, as I say, the, the top layer, is the loudest one, is um, expressive. And so um, what we did there was, I find that when you, um, when you play a lot of uh, samples that hold a lot of expression or that you want to really zing out, you have um, the loudest fortissimo level and you've got players that are playing very heavy bow um, on the strings for as long as possible, and it, which is in itself feels quite unmusical. Sure. Because um, obviously you've just moved the bow faster for a louder um, part of a piece. And um, so what I was trying to do with this is allow the players to do many rebows for each note, but it can kind of put a little bit more musicality into it sure. and um, more expression so that when you get there, you've got something that really zings out. So that was the, the top layer. And then in the middle, we did something where you still have that kind of rebowing um, uh, complication in there, but it's slightly more sat back and it sort of bridges the gap between Gotcha. And it was interesting just what, playing what I was playing there, I felt myself waiting a little bit longer before changing the note to feel that there was a, a bow change. And that's something that's really interesting to kind of react with the performance. Responding to the way it's being played, very much. I, th it, I think it's uh, it's amazing how the ear is so in tune to how long and low it is going to be. By you can hear the length of the bowing that they sure. um, play. So it does push you into a certain kind of um, uh, tempo sometimes, where you feel the the breadth of the note, the wave of it, and it, how it moves you. I think that that's what makes it absorbing. It's a very absorbing song because you're kind of, uh, it's feeding you and um, uh, feeding you information that you then respond to and um, work with. Absolutely. Well, before we move on to the other sounds, I think the other thing that's important to mention is, 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 is libraries of this size, very small, are very difficult to make sound kind of good. I mean, this for me is like master quality. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, uh, we're all kind of find, even the small chamber libraries can sound enormous. And I think this is, again, what goes, feeds into this kind of British drama thing, is it's kind of a cerebral, it's a small sound, but it's incredibly expressive nevertheless. So it's not like an epic kind of thing. No, but I, I think that uh, it's interesting often when I'm um, scoring uh, you think that you really need, um, say, the big orchestra for big moments, but it's not always the case because um, I think what a large string ensemble does fantastically well is it supports um, emotion under dialogue. Yeah. So that I always think of it like a, um, a football crowd. If you've got lots of voices, you, they're all shouting away, but you don't really zone in on what anybody's saying. There's this homogenous... Um, sound that comes across. Whereas if you have one person talking, you listen to what they say, you focus on it, and it's the same with strings. If you've got a um, solo violin playing, you're going to hear what it's doing far more than 
60, you know. Sure. And so um, when you are actually articulating British stories or something that doesn't require kind of robots storming the, the nation, <laughs> uh, there is a lot of character um, development. There's a lot of kind of slightly more pointed, introspective kind of moods. And I think that, you know, a smaller chamber style suits that very well. Absolutely, and I think I know a lot of computer games composers who would be absolutely kind of dying for this because, again, they have to produce music by the pound. Yeah. And it is, there's something, I think that we, we uh, let a very good friend of ours uh, try this and uh, he was on a deadline and kind of stayed up all night because he went down the rabbit hole with this. Should we have a look at what else is in there? Yeah. Um, okay, so it, it all started with the cello and then thought that if this is going to be a library that you want to uh, get your hands on the keyboard to experience everything, it'd be great to have the, the full breadth. So we did uh, basses, cellos, viola and violin, and then we did um, bass clarinet, clarinet, flute and piccolo. Right. And then the fun comes when we start mixing it up and um, doing slightly different combinations of things. But uh, let's do uh, the clarinet and bass clarinet. <laughs> And it is very, it's very different as well. It's, it's kind of, it's, 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 I, it is kind of its own thing, isn't it? Very much so. I mean, it's not going to um, be all things to all, you know, but all situations, but. It does, I think one of the things I like about it is that it's got a lot of personality in it. Yeah. I mean, some of these, uh, you've um, got sort of flutterings and movement, and then there are some that are much straighter. Than... But I think with normal samples, you'd have, say, you load up your uh, bass clarinet and then um, you have some beautiful texture going on and then you try and uh, write a melody over the top, but you've got every single sample triggering the whole thing. Yes. And, it, and uh, so this is a way of kind of making your, the process more conducive Absolutely. to um, just sitting there. So you're composing practice. with the instruments, not kind of, okay, I've written this on a, paddy string sound or a piano and now, yeah. and now I have to already just switch my brain over to kind of programming arranging mode. It's kind of, it's, it's more instant. Absolutely, and I think that quite often I will, um, I'll actually just be writing or sketching on a piano and then move to samples. But um, it's not always uh, the most inspiring. You can sometimes hear that um, uh, when a string arrangement has been written on a piano yeah and then there's certain things so if I move to um, some other strings for example if I was to write something like this on um, uh, piano you would have moved already yeah it, it... but you see for, so, so exciting for a piano you'd have uh, You'd be there going, right, it's really about time I change the floor. <laughs> but, you know. There is no sound anymore, yeah. yes. And um, so, yeah, you just kind of instantly get a vibe and a sense of um, what it can do. So, so this is double bass and viola. And this is something you recommend is kind of mixing and matching. Well, the, yeah, these are just a couple of my kind of favourite patches. For me, it's just that, uh, oh, God, another scene and I'm knackered. And then you just go, oh. And I think it's the kind of thing that directors really like, that very kind of um, vibey, kind of quite, quite real. <laughs> it's great with the sustain pedal as well. I'm a bit of a sustain pedal, um, I won't say it, tart. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's for uh, directors when you, you're there, you kind of feel you're blue in the face going, don't worry, it's going to sound okay when it's recorded. Absolutely. It's gonna, you know, and then also if you did play them, um, uh, your great idea, which is, right, this is the piano theme, and then you're... And they're 
on a piano, I think you'd get fired around about. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's uh, about uh, creating something that is um, going to give you that scope, something that will um, uh, be able to make, uh, help you move very quickly mm -hmm. um, and be inspired by the, um, you know, what it gives you and the, the sounds that having a certain kind of attitude within the samples and something that's Absolutely. got personality. Yeah. So this was recorded here at the HQ, which is where we did the LCO library. And you actually produced kind of each note, so to speak, and worked very closely with some great musicians on this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, what was very important for me is that within all of the textures, that it didn't just start to sound um, scary and yeah. horror genre. You know, you, the textures are there to create interest. As I was saying, you can hold down a chord for a, a nice length of time and they're still, it never feels static. And also because you've got these kind of rebos and that sort of thing, the, yeah. the interaction between the notes are constantly firing off each other in a different way. But it's not about it being scary strings. You know, it's yeah. not. Um, uh, and I think a lot of those textures, it can start to uh, inch towards kind of atonal mm -hmm. freaky scores and so we really wanted to get a, a sense that uh, within those elements they would be really as useful as possible and then I think with the uh, the expressive layers you want uh, that feeling of there's a lot of musicality there but you don't want it to be confined that you can only play it in one way Yes, and it's not a it's not a phrase library. That's the, that's that kind of really the in between point of something yeah. static and something that basically someone else's music. Yeah. Um, what else have we got? This is um, violin, harmonics, a bit of piccolo, flute, and cello. So you have some. Um One patch wonders. One patch. So, <laughs> so yeah, and, and that's the, the nice thing, the way I think that you, um, you can separate it out so that you can kind of go, um, I'm going to uh, hold some tension, say. And then your um, main villain walks in. And you're, but you haven't left the, your patch, you know, you haven't had to go, um, you know, you could be writing something like that while looking at the screen. Yes. And you, you're watching the film as it's going and uh, you, you write it, you, you kind of sketch out a cue very fast without going, okay, what BPM am I at? Yes, what are we, you know? absolutely. And then absolutely. you can, and it's so very conducive for rubato and that sort of stuff because you're actually just playing and performing it. Absolutely. The one, something I learned years and years ago is, uh, is to actually put the scores down when recording live musicians because I realised that my job is to see how the music is working with the picture. And I think so often, you know, you really want to work with, with the picture, but you kind of get, get, get drawn into, oh, God, I better get a, get a click going and what did I just do then because I've got to arrange that for oboe and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I was th uh, going back to some of the um, the Evo grids and that kind of thing. They are um, uh, they just sound amazing, but you do ha find that because there is a evolution to them, you um, you hold these things down and go, yes, this is really working with the picture, and then, and then you try and change chord, but you'll reset back at the beginning of another yeah, evolution, exactly. and and so uh, this I think gives you something that's a little bit more immediate, something that you can just interact with more change around more and uh, move it without losing a sense of this is these are just cold chords that aren't doing anything yeah you know? absolutely absolutely we've done a few um patches where we've just put everything together what we found was the uh, the textures uh, work brilliantly when you put everything together but you want to have your solo instrument just zinging out on top without it being, you know, so if you say you've got a, um, it, it'd be quite rare, I think, that you'd write for a, say, a cello and clarinet absolutely in unison playing yes. exactly the same thing. So the, the loudest layer is, um, uh, you know, we've done one with everything, with all the uh, 
strings as soloists and then all the woodwinds. I see. So this one is uh, with the woods, so you have your string textures. I'm sorry, strings and woodwind textures. And then... Um, flute there, piccolo up here. Then you've got your... Um, so you can, uh, when you're writing, I find that you can um, you can choose where you, if you want some uh, harmony, high harmony chords up here. And then you've got the ability to um, choose where you're going to let a particular instrument shine, you know, through the range. It's, it's such a simple idea. It's, just like, it's one of those things, like, why haven't we done this yet? Well, I find that you know, when I'm um, sitting down thinking what kind of orchestration am I going to use or how am I going to write this, normally I do something where, okay, I'll get an, a, song, a string ensemble patch and then um, a woodwind ensemble patch, whack them over each other, but then everything that you're hitting is triggering absolutely everything. And you're just kind of like, I'm not really, I now have to go into it and really start picking out yeah, what's, yeah. Going, what's going on. And um, uh, so, yeah, and we try to do as many different kind of um, interesting combinations. Um, this is another one with, uh, so this is everything playing the textures again. Um, <laughs> with um, uh, the strings being the soloists. So. Then you've got violins. And up there. Uh, we tried several different kinds of textures and then so we've got alternative versions which are, have a little bit more going on in them this was the point where Stanley our head of production said uh, guys uh, the scope of this library has changed <laughs> a little bit it became a bit of a train set didn't it yeah well it was gonna I was just when I got you over to the studio, just going, well, let's do a cello. But then, you know, obviously, <laughs> it just kind of, yeah. <laughs> Before we uh, sign off, you showed me something a little bit uh, cheeky and naughty, which is uh, using it in combination with a larger, um, I wouldn't say static library, but a larger, uh, more traditional library, Tundra. Oh. Take us through how you would mix a velocity-based library with a more traditional modulation wheel-based one. In this case, this is the uh, viola patch. Um, and the, the double bass mixed with uh, the floor tandos. And um, because um, when you play the bridge drum toolkit, uh, it's just touch sensitive, you can then ride up the tundra patches with the uh, mod wheel. So it sounds a bit like this. Help if you've got three hands. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks as always for watching. If you're new to the channel, hit subscribe. If you like what we do, hit like. And if you want to be notified about new videos, ring that bell.